Good morning. It's so great to see you all. Welcome to all of you who are here in our family room, and welcome as well to all of you who are worshiping in your own family rooms. That's uh, part of 2020. We've got the opportunity to be the family of God here and in living rooms across the metro area. Little mini congregations are forming. We call them house to house. Um, groups, and we're so glad that we can all be together and not neglect meeting together as the Word of God teaches, even while we have to be vigilant about public health. So uh, I hope that public health has not capped your joy this week. It hasn't mine. So many good things happening in the midst of such a tense time. One thing I'm really excited about is what Pastor George just shared, that we're expanding the, the food pantry now to be the food and winter clothing and supplies pantry because if we have means to do good and we don't do it, like what's the point? What are we doing here? And when we have people who are poor or in need come to our door, as George described, you know, we're not a shelter. We're not equipped or approved to be able to do that. But what we have, what we are able to bring, um, we should be able to give. And if it, uh, virtually all of us have an extra coat or a blanket sitting at home, that you know, like don't throw away because, you know, you, you used it when you moved out of your mom and dad's home and you wrapped the furniture in it, but you still have it. That might be life-saving for someone else. Wanted to add one thing that George forgot in, in addition to um, the winter clothing you mentioned, coats, hats, gloves, super important. We also, hear me, this is important, we need your old or extra leg warmers because those things are like going to get cold in a couple weeks and you got to hook up a brother when his ankles are exposed like that. <laughs> I'm talking about like 1984 flash dance. Some of you young people don't know what I'm talking about. But those of you who are over 40, you know you probably still have a pair of leg warmers. And so George needs them. All right, we're continuing and wrapping up our series called the... <laughs> All right, stop laughing. We're in church. Would you get serious already? This is important stuff we're talking about. All right, we're, it's good. There hasn't been enough laughter lately. It's been a particularly tense week. Anyone else feel that? It's everywhere. We're in a series that we finished this morning called The Public Square, talking about what does it mean to be followers of Jesus, to be Christians in the public square, in the, the national discourse. Are we to recuse ourselves? Are we to uh, wave the flag of one candidate or political party or the other? How do we engage? We talked about how we're to think about this according to God's word, and then how we're to talk about it. I thought Pastor George did such a great job last week discussing um, the, the idea of how to engage one another around these tender and volatile topics of politics and, and government. You know, this week, uh, it seems like 2020 is coming to a crescendo, right? I, I mean, maybe not. M maybe the election is only a false crescendo, and a meteor strikes the planet in December or there's a zombie apocalypse or, or something else like that. But, but barring that, I think we might be in for uh, our, our grand finale of 2020 uh, craziness. Did you see this yesterday in the news? Walmart pulled all the guns and ammunition from all of the shelves in their stores across the country. And they didn't suddenly have a change of heart about selling guns. They just recognized that it is not in the public safety interest to sell them this week. The National Guard is being stood up in many states where there are cities um, that, that we've seen particularly contentious public discourse What's our world going to look like? What is Denver going to look like on Thursday? You know, give it a day for all the ballots to be counted or not counted and, um, you know, for the, the candidates to accept or, or not accept the outcome. And then the, the, the public response, what's it going to feel like to go outside when you get up in the morning by Thursday or Friday of next week? It's hard to imagine. And so this morning, as we conclude our series, you know, most of us probably in Colorado, if we're going to vote, have already done so. Some maybe haven't, but we, we vote early here. And so it's, it seems less significant to talk about what you should vote for and more to continue to explore that idea that, that Pastor George asked last week. It's one of those that I heard and I thought it was profound. And then it kept kind of rattling around in my head that, that there is a way 
right away that characterizes Jesus and his people. I loved that you pointed out that the, the earliest Christians, before they became known as such, they were known by the moniker the way, right? And that the way we talk about politics, government, and public life is as important as the things we say, and maybe it's more so. And so as we look at Election Day, and then the aftermath, whatever that might be. What I want to talk to you about this morning is, is the way forward and what that means for us as, as God's people. Well, I love that. <laughs> Can you just show that? They have amen signs. That's awesome. Ah! All right, I'm going to talk right here. So the way forward is what we're talking about this morning. Um, what a profound idea, right? The, I, I went home and was thinking about that idea, and it occurred to me, in, hidden in plain sight, in one of the most famous New Testament verses and sayings of Jesus, this idea comes forward, and that is Jesus talking to his disciples just before he goes to the cross, kind of preparing them that he's going away. He's like, don't worry, you don't have to freak out. You know where I'm going, and they're like, hey, we don't know anything about where you're going. How could we possibly know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And what I think you see embedded in this familiar and so often preached verse of Scripture is that Jesus is first a way, and the truth a distant second. I've read to you many times from one of my favorite authors, a, a veteran pastor who went home to be with the Lord a couple of years ago, Eugene Peterson, from his book called The Jesus Way. Listen to what he wrote. The Jesus Way, wedded to the Jesus truth, brings about the Jesus life. We can't proclaim the Jesus truth, but then do it any old way we like. Nor can we follow the Jesus way without speaking the Jesus truth. But Jesus, as the truth, listen, gets far more attention than Jesus as the way. Jesus as the way is the most frequently evaded metaphor among the Christians with whom I have worked for 50 years as a North American pastor. In the text that Jesus sets before us so clearly and definitively, that's the one we just read, way comes first. We cannot skip the way of Jesus in our hurry to get to the truth of Jesus as he is worshipped and proclaimed. We cannot skip the way of Jesus in our hurry to get to the truth. The way of Jesus is the way that we practice and come to understand the truth of Jesus. Living Jesus in our homes and workplaces with our friends and our family. He concludes this passage with this. The North American church at present is conspicuous for replacing the Jesus way with the American way. Anyone relate to that? We are to be Americans, I believe, Jesus makes clear, if he doesn't say Americans, we are citizens of this world as well as citizens of heaven. And he left us here on purpose, on mission. We are to give to Caesar what is Caesar's, as Jesus so clearly and memorably put it. We're to participate in civic life, and our nation needs the people of God now more than ever. But we're not to do it the American way. In Matthew 23, Jesus is speaking of the civic leaders of his own day. Remember, it was a theocracy, so the priests and leading religious officials, they were the government leadership. And he says, you need to do what they say because they're in charge. You need to respect the governing authorities, but don't do what they do. Listen to them, but don't be like them. And I think that's foundationally important for our way forward. We've watched as our national discourse has devolved into third grade taunting and name calling. And we as Americans have followed suit. Now, it's easy for us to point out where we see that happening elsewhere. I thought one of the most insightful points you made last week, George, was that you hear a sermon like that and you're like, man, that's so good. So many people I know need to hear that. I'm going to send this to like several of them. And, and, and it maybe doesn't land the ways that we're that person 
right? So the fact that we maybe do government and civic life the American way rather than the Jesus way, it applies to so many around us. We can say, oh, that's right. all you got to do is open your social media feed and you can get mad for days about how stupid and angry people are and how they're missing the forest for the trees and how unchristian that comes across. And maybe it's true, right? But I think the American way has infused all of us because we've grown up and we've been steeped in it from birth. It's the culture air we've breathed. Like, frivolous example, every American knows the experience of sort of irrational indignation and offense that you feel when you find a hair in your food, right? You go anywhere else in the world, half the planet is starving and they're like grateful for food. They'll take it with hair or without. Most other places, they're like, oh, I got a hair. They pull it out, they set it aside. But no, we get a hair in our food and we want to talk to the manager and we all turn into Karen and we're like... We're calling the health officials. We're like taking the sanitation grade A plaque down off the wall and we're letting the waiter have it and we're doing it loud enough to make sure that the person at the table next to us hears that we had a hair in our food. I too have done this. I re- it took me the better part of a full decade to make my peace with fettuccine Alfredo. <laughs> Has this happened to you? Well, it's because I was, I was in college and... In the, in the cafeteria, I had ordered the fettuccine Alfredo and I sat down to eat it. And it's already like stringy and long and kind of fibrous. But you know how your mouth before your brain catches up will detect a, a slightly different texture? So you kind of discreetly go like, That was my experience. It was so long. And I marched up to the cafeteria lady who had the hair and the net, and I'm like, that was in my fettuccine. I said it loud enough that everybody in line could hear, right? There's a little American way in all of us, and we don't own it, but we bring it into the public square at the times that it's most tense. When the people of God are most needed, we turn into the people of the world. And I think the Jesus way is as important as the Jesus truth. And maybe there's a shortage of it right now. So maybe it's even more so. Like there's no shortage of Jesus truth being spouted. But how many people are hearing or picking up what we're putting down? Right? Maybe we're espousing the Jesus truth, but I'm not sure we have our minds around the Jesus way. I think what happens is we tend to do Jesus the American way. And it may be that God's asking us to do America the Jesus way. It's a good place to hold up the amen sign. Yeah, totally. (laughs) So let's look at the Jesus way. What is it? Jesus, I think, laid out his philosophy, his way, his filter that you could apply to any number of situations, purposes, interactions, or endeavors. And so we're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus most comprehensively details his way. We're going to start in Matthew chapter 6. Verse 25, Jesus says, Do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on, because it's not life more than food and the body more than clothing. The Gentiles seek after these things. Jesus' way, first, is to live without anxiety. Now, he's talking about food and clothes, but the point is, he's not talking about frivolous things. He's talking about serious things, things that are necessary, right? He's not saying, don't, don't, you're a Christian. You should be heavenly minded. Don't worry about, like, how this season of keeping up with the Kardashians is going to end or something stupid and frivolous. He's saying food. You know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, these are pretty near the top clothes, shelter. Don't worry about it. Care about it, but don't freak out about it. He's saying your heavenly father knows you need these things and freaking out about stuff of this world, that's what the pagans do. You're the people of God. The Jesus way is to care, but not freak out, right? It's to to live a little above the fracas. Fracas. You're saying it in your mind. Fracas. To live a little above it, the fracas. Kind of want to say it wistfully. 
right? To, to, to engage it fully, but not bring the atmosphere down. Jesus' way is seen in how he interacts in a thousand different situations, all of which matter to him, right? Jesus cared more than all the humans he came and got tormented by combined. He literally had the weight of the world on his shoulders. The people he created, he was there to die for, and they weren't even going to recognize it or say thank you. And yet, his interactions, more than anything else, I think most consistently you could call relaxed. Jesus was relaxed. He cared, but he didn't freak out with them. And in fact, part of what they didn't like about him was that he didn't. He kept his cool. And I think that's what Scripture's saying. You know, it says in Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, with prayer and petition, make your requests known to God. And then the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And I think we kind of translate those things the way we want to hear them or the way we've learned them and we soften it and we kind of make it sound like this. You know, you don't need to worry. You don't need to be anxious, little one. It's okay. But it's more like a command. Be anxious for nothing. Kind of like thou shalt not right? And he says, when you care, but take the thing you would worry about and bring it before God, then his peace that transcends understanding is going to guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And you're like, peace doesn't make sense in that moment. It's a moment for craziness. It's a moment where you got to be louder than the person on the other side of the split screen if you're even going to get heard. But he says that's the point. It's not peace. Jesus said, I don't give to you like the world gives to you. The peace I give to you is different. It's a peace that transcends understanding. It doesn't make sense. And in spite of the chaos, the craziness, the fracas all around you, Jesus' peace is going to fill you and flow out of you. And the world needs more of that. Our country desperately needs more of that. And you and I are his agents to supply it. So can we engage politics and not mistake it for an existential crisis? Can we have these discussions and remember that our hope is not in a politician or a political party? That a war horse with all its strength cannot save, neither can a country, even a country as great and generous and economically strong as ours. That our hope comes from the Lord. And so can we engage the conversation and not freak out? That's Jesus' way. And in the days and weeks that follow, I think not freaking out is going to be like toilet paper in April. It's going to be hard to find. And so if we can be the people who care but remain sane and remind everybody that probably the world's going to keep turning, if your candidate didn't get elected, I think we do a lot of good in Jesus' name just at that point. Okay, Matthew 7, he continues in verse 1, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Jesus' way is to heed your conscience, right, without judgment. We've talked about at the beginning, how I believe Scripture's best guidance with regard to our civic participation, our responsibility, is to vote your Christ-formed conscience. And that is to say, vote in response to what Jesus' renewal of you informs or motivates. Now, here's the thing about our formation in Christ. No two people experience it the same. Jesus being formed in us is not a linear process. That's why the 12-step manuals and the six-week courses very seldom produce mature disciples of Jesus because it's not a linear process. It's organic and it's circuitous at best. Jesus is famous for meeting people not where he thinks they ought to be or ought to begin, but where we actually are. And so somebody who comes to Jesus addicted, he might start with physical deliverance, with working freedom from chemical dependency. Somebody who comes to him brokenhearted, Jesus might start with healing their backstory. Wherever Jesus starts with us, wherever we are in that journey of progression with him, he's forming us in him and he's forming our sisters and brothers as well. And from the overflow of that formation, we must vote according to the conscience, as Christ is forming it. Now, what Jesus is saying here is don't judge one another's 
Christ-formed conscience. We don't need to be saying, you aren't doing it right because your conscience isn't saying what my conscience is saying. How many times do you read social media and you think, they're so right, they're wrong? You know, there's... This is where it gets real, right? There is sitting in this very small approximation of our normal room, ones of us who believe passionately on this spectrum uh, on both sides, right? Ones that would get into it and you couldn't get out of it. We could, I mean, we're, we're like a millimeter from a meltdown right now. There is sitting maybe in the row or a row behind you somebody who virulently disagrees with you and, and they're responding to what they believe is Jesus working in them. So our options are either to judge, to judge, judge one another for not thinking that what we think is most important um, is most important, and then go away to a homogenous community of people who think just like us, which is always an option, but by virtue of the fact that you're here, having driven by several good churches on the way, you're here on purpose. Or we can learn to respect one another and not judge one another and recognize that each of us has the privilege of, in fact, being us, right? Right? of being the one in whom Jesus also lives, the one for whom Jesus also died. And Jesus is working in each of us. And so can it be enough for me to vote my conscience as Christ is forming it and you to vote yours? And we discuss it, but without the, the, the judgment. Like I've heard this, there are no shortage of, and I, I have no fault for this. I think this is a perfectly rational way to a, approach um, civic responsibility. Christians who say that it's about one issue, I can't get any farther than that. We are made a little lower than the angels. We are made in God's image. We are um, His creation. Scripture makes clear that He knew us um, when He was knitting us together in our mother's womb. And so the, the killing of unborn life, I can't vote for anything other than that issue. And because, I mean, we've seen a what, nearing 70 million person American genocide. This grieves the heart of God. It grieves me. And listen, it grieves me deeply. And and I'm with you all the way there until that conversation spills over the edge and says, and so I don't, anybody who doesn't vote that way, I don't know if they're a Christian. See, that's where we've just crossed that line out of the Jesus way. Or, you know what, I, I, some vote on a, on, on a person or a a, a tone, like our our con, Our country's discourse has become so shrill and so immature and so broken that I think we need mature adult leadership that can basic that can show basic respect to one another, to our citizens, to um, to minorities and women, to other nations. And anyone who doesn't think that, I don't see how they could be a Christian. See, I'm with you all the way until that last sentence. But Jesus' way has to wrap around his truth. And see, both of those reflect Christ-formed truth, but either of them can be done not at all in Jesus' way. And listen, our church, the church, our nation needs no more of that. It is pulling us apart. And it's time for the people of God to stand up and show a yet more excellent way. Believe, vote, care, advocate passionately for what Jesus is informed in you. And judge not, listen, lest ye be judged. Oh, there's more I want to say about this, but I want to honor your... Let me just say this real quick, real quick. Um, here's, where this, here's where this gets onto a slippery slope, is that sounds a little like relativism, right? What, what are you saying? Like, what's true for me is true for me, and what's true for you is true for you? Isn't that the opposite of what we believe? Don't we believe there's capital T truth? Yes, but we believe truth is, is a large, complex entity of which 
all of us are grasping in part, right? The Scripture says we look through a glass dimly, like Plato's elephant, a bunch of blind men trying to describe it. One says it's thick like a tree trunk. One says it's long and curvy like a fire hose, and the other says it's flat like a pancake. None of them is wrong, but in his fable, they get into a fight because each of them is limited in his perception. We're all grasping, apprehending a portion of truth. It's not relative, it's absolute, but none of us is God. And none of us has been made the arbiter of his truth, and none of us has a monopoly on it. And I think that's the Jesus way. Harper Lee made this um, amazing observation about us humans in To Kill a Mockingbird. The one thing that doesn't abide by majority rule is a person's conscience. Verse 3, wrap it up here. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out when there's the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take out the log in your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. First take the log out of your own eye. The Jesus way involves self-reflection. Jesus' way is to prioritize looking at ourselves. Like we began with, it's easy to say, man, I know so many people that need to hear this message. I need to hear this message. Begins with self-reflection. That log and speck thing kind of is a bit of a, of a philosophical uh, tripwire, right? Because logically, if everybody's thing is a log, whose is the speck? right? Take the log out of your own eye before you take his speck out, but he's supposed to take the log out of his eye. So which, which is the log and which is the speck? And I think we missed the point there, right? If you took, Math Geeks, the absolute value of your, the, the foreign object in your eye, and you took the absolute value of the foreign object in her eye, I don't know which is bigger. But I think the point is, it's a log if it's in your eye. What makes it a log is that it's in you, Right? Jesus' point was, start with you. It's intrinsically bigger, the thing in you, for your interest than the thing in her. And so work on that one. I think that most of us, here's the problem, we would take a log out of our eye if we knew it was there. It's not like he's saying, take something out of your eye that you really wish were, could stay there. Oh, Jesus, come on, I want to keep that thing in my eye. Like, take out your colored contacts. Come on, they're go- they, they match my outfit, Jesus. He's not saying that. He's saying, take out something that would not in any way be nice to have in your eye. The point is, we would all take it out whether or not we were instructed to by the Lord and Savior if we knew it was there, right? So know it's there. That takes pausing and prioritizing self-reflection. How am I coming across? Can we ask ourselves that as we start this shrill, chaotic, 2020 crescendo week? How am I representing Jesus? How are people perceiving me in this discourse? Because whatever truth I may bring is going to get flushed right down the toilet if it's not coming in the Jesus way. Jesus wraps this portion of the Sermon on the Mount up by saying, don't throw your pearls to swine and don't give what's sacred to the dogs. He kind of brings a full circle to where we began. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Engage this thing. Jesus' voice through you is needed in our public square more than ever before. But give to God what is God's. Don't take what is sacred and throw it to the dogs. What are the pearls? What's that costly thing that we've fought so hard for? What's going to change our city in our generation? Is it that nugget of truth that they've been trying to say for 50 years, but you're going to, your, your pithy social media post, your sarcastic video is going to be the thing that pushes them over the edge of understanding? Is it that? What's sacred among us? I would suggest it's the unity, the hard-fought unity that we hold out to the watching world. Jesus prayed for us that we would be one because our unity would show them how much God loves them and that he sent Jesus to make all things new. 
It's not in our careful, cogent, comprehensive articulation of the truth, but it's in the way we embody it. It's in our coming together across the political divide that could end this church today. I mean, I'm one discussion question on the screen afterward from all of us going away hating on each other. But is there enough love in Jesus for us to agree to disagree, as the cliche goes, to respect and honor the Christ-formed conscience of each other, to hear one another, like Pastor George taught us last week, and then nevertheless to recognize that it is Christ in us that is the hope of glory. It's not our elected officials. It's not a political party. It's not our country even optimally run. America is not the hope of the world and an American election, however perilous it might feel, is not an existential crisis. The world isn't going to be put to rights if America has a better government. The world is going to be put to rights when Jesus puts it that way. And the way Jesus puts it that way is through you, is through your love, and is through your unity. That's what changes our city. That's what changes our country. And that's why Jesus called us to represent him in the public square. Amen? Okay, so if I haven't offended absolutely every one of you, would you stand up and let's pray together? Are you all right? You doing okay? Do we need to do the Nico thing and like do the back rub circle? Or I guess we can't really do that, right? (laughs) Father, thank you that in every season, in every situation, that you are God, you reign supreme. And Jesus, that you presided, you installed God's software into a broken world and that you gave it to us to proliferate. Thank you for the way that you did things. We are amazed at you. How you kept your cool. So hard for me to do that. People are writing in your comments on social media and you want to rip them a new one. You never did, except that one time at the tables. But that was like the exception that proved the rule. Most of the time you didn't. Lord, maybe there's that time for us, but help us to model your way. God, we need your help. Give us self-control this week. Give us wisdom and compassion this week. Help us to practice those very practical things in that triangle that Pastor George showed us last week. Help us not to judge, God. Forgive us. Would you forgive us for judging one another? Lord, let your way change the world. And would you bless our nation? God, we need you. Help our leaders. Whoever is elected, Lord, we pray that you would give him wisdom, humility, that he would look to you for guidance, that he would recognize your authority in his life and our nation, and that you would guide his hand. Lord, we pray for peace against the threats of unrest and violence. Father, we pray you would heal the divides in our nation and let us be agents of that healing. We trust you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.